policy research centre based at the universities of um, well, the London School of Economics and, and Oxford University in the UK. It's essentially uh, funded by, by DFID, but it has an arm's length relationship with DFID in terms of its work. Um, the, the work that it does is intended, and it does generally support uh, sustainable economic growth in developing countries. Uh, there are 10 IGC offices currently, six in, in Africa, um, one of which obviously is the Zambian office, and my colleagues um, in the Zambian office are, are here today. Also, our, our hub economist based at the London School of Economics is, is here tonight as well, um, Karine El Beruti. Um, the IGC came, well, the, uh, there was an agreement essentially between the then Secretary of the Treasury and the IGC late in 2010 that we would work together. The IGC would set up an office and would engage with the Ministry of Finance and National Planning um, and with other government departments, but starting with the relationship with the Minister of Finance and National Planning and the Secretary of the Treasury. Um, and, and we have established that relationship. And, and more recently, le very late last year, um, that relationship was renewed um, with the new Secretary of the Treasury who also um, had a, reviewed our work program and asked us to do a few additional things going forward. Um, our partner in, in, in Zambia, and very, very important partner, without which we couldn't have had this event and uh, many other activities, is ZIPAR, the, the Zambian Institute for Policy Analysis and Research, which some of you, I'm sure many of you know about. Um, our little office is located within the ZIPAR office, and we also have a number of joint um, research projects where we have one active and several that are emerging joint research projects with, with ZIPAR. So it's an, an important part of our existence in, in Zambia. Uh, and we're a very successful partnership so far. The, the mission of the IDC is essentially to support um, sustainable economic growth through providing access to and generating the best ideas that we can about economic growth. So we try to access the best researchers in Zambia and outside of Zambia to work on key issues of importance to Zambia. One example, I think one of our best examples, uh, you'll, you'll hear from shortly. Um, the, the tools that we use include research in particular, that's our core business, policy engagement, um, these kinds of engagements with people who are interested in the policy issues. We, we meet uh, you know, privately with different government departments in broader meetings with stakeholders, and we try to engage on these policy issues and bring new ideas uh, and useful ideas into the discussion. And we also have a, a rapid response um, activity which, is, which allows us to respond at relatively short notice to um, the government's uh, urgent needs for ideas on particular issues. Um, and in fact, Bob Conrad's relationship uh, with the IGC in Zambia and the Zambian government began out of a rapid response project, but it evolved into a series of follow-up activities which we are very grateful for. Um, so th that's essentially um, what we're doing. Some of our other projects, other than the mining taxation uh, program which, which uh, Bob is driving, include work that was done. In fact, there was a seminar on it in this room um, two months ago or three months ago on the informal sector and taxation issues in Zambia. We, we're doing work on trade integration, uh, the options for Zambia, um, recommendations or just some of the issues that are arising out of the quite complicated trade uh, relationships in Africa and the range of possible partnerships. Um, we're doing work on um, non-traditional exports, particularly non-traditional agricultural exports, exports to try to get a sense of where the likely successes are going to be, especially in um, opportunities for employment creation and the, the, the better distribution of, of income in Zambia. Um, and, and, and the generation of wealth in Zambia. Um, we're doing a joint project with ZIPO looking at the way that capital projects are developed within government. Um, and we also have a project on 
um, the, the use of tax incentives for investment promotion and looking at um, best practice in investment promotion. There are a number of other um, proposals that we have on the table going forward during the course of this year that we're going to discuss with, uh, with, with, with government and the group of stakeholders over the next short while. Thank you very much. I'll hand back to you. Uh, I have a few objectives uh, for us to discuss this evening, uh, and so I'd like to get right, right to the point. Um, I want us to spend a few minutes trying to get uh, an understanding of Zambia's uh, fiscal regime in the context of, of some comparative international experience. Um, and I also want to spend a few minutes looking at form and function. Um, and it'll be clear what I mean by talking about form and function uh, as, as we go through the presentation and, and begin to discuss the issues. Um, and obviously to make some suggestions uh, based on um, my observations of what I've learned in Zambia. Um, and of course, uh, like any country, uh, there are always claims made uh, that mining firms are not paying their fair share. Uh, uh, but you can join the rest of the world. Uh, the United States, the way economists measure effective taxes, mining has the lowest effective tax rates of all industries in the United States. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the way economists measure tax, tax rates uh, for mining in the United States, the marginal effective tax rates are negative. There is actually a subsidy at the margin. Uh, the way, again, once again, the way economists measure it. So we can discuss what we mean by these different measures of effective tax rates um, and, and talk about some of the reasons why, why those rates may be the way they are uh, in the context of the discussion. <coughs> now, uh, for lack of a better term, I'm going to talk about fiscal regimes. I'm not going to talk about tax regimes, and it'll be clear why I want to talk about fiscal regimes as we go through the discussion. Um, basically, there are th these things um, uh, come in three general categories. First of all, there's what's called the traditional tax royalty regime. Royalty is paid for the rights to extract. Then there's the generally applicable tax system. Uh, Zambia's system is, is, is one variant of, of that uh, tax royalty regime. Uh, the, second, the second regime is, is what's called uh, production sharing, which is much, much more common in, um, in petroleum. Uh, started years ago, the, fir the first successful model production sharing contract was in Indonesia more than 30 years ago. Uh, and production sharing is, is a fairly common phenomena uh, in, um, in petroleum, not so much in, in mining, uh, but there, there are examples where you can see um, production sharing uh, contracts uh, in, in mining as well. Um, and under production sharing, it's, the accounting is done based on units of production. Uh, and the sharing of output. But of course, at the end of the day, it comes down to cash. Um, uh, and then the third, the, third set, the third type of contract, which is becoming a bit more common, again, in, in petroleum, uh, is a service contract, uh, where the resource owner, and in many countries, uh, the resource owner will be the government, uh, maintains both the mineral rights and the operating rights uh, and enters and there's into a service contract with a producer to um, provide the service of development and extraction. We're all familiar with service contracts. Uh, you get, get up in the morning and go to work. That's a service contract. That's basically the, the, the fundamental element of a service contract. Um, uh, pay for service. Uh, Subtle, there are lots of subtleties to them. Uh, there, there's the generally applicable tax regime, but at the end of the day, you get paid, you pay your tax, 
uh, and you get to keep what's left over. Um, and so uh, service contracts are becoming, becoming a bit more, more important, uh, again, particularly in petroleum. Now, let me say these are forms. These are forms. And as a good economist, I can design the form so that if you're the resource owner, I can design the form so that you get the same amount of money in expected value terms independent of the form. That's purely just an analytical exercise. What's different is the way the risks are shared. And one of the things we may want to discuss as we go through this, 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 this discussion this evening is the relative risk that is shared with these, with these different contract forms. So being a good analyst, a good, I'm, I'm, I'm a good analyst, a reasonably good analyst, I can, I can dot the I's and I can cross the T's and I can, if you want $50, and you want to use a service contract, I can get you $50, okay? Or if you want to use a tax royalty regime, I can get you $50. But the difference is going to be in how those risks are shared uh, with respect to those contract forms. So from my perspective, this is form, and, and even though there's lots of discussion about these things, there's really, from my perspective as an economist, not a lot of substance. That the substance has to do with the actual payment structures themselves. <coughs> and as you see here, these tax royalty, the tax royalty regimes, production sharing regimes, service contracts, generally have, the, have similar payment structures to, to some aspects of them. Um, they may or may not, depending on the country. Um, but, there, but there's every reason to believe that um, these payment structures, including, and let me put a, put a note here, withholding taxes on distributions abroad may, may become an important issue. <coughs> now, Zambia in this context. Zambia, ha from, for, if you put it in one of these categories, has a basic tax royalty regime. Royalties paid on, on some measure of production. <clears throat> um, there's a, and uh, in general, that regime, in general, things are very, if you look at the paper, uh, which it, this, what I'm, uh, my talk tonight uh, is based on a paper that's coming out in a book on Zambia. If you look at the paper, there's lots of international experience in that paper. Things vary by country, rates vary, that type of thing, but general, general the, the form's the same. Um, few countries have production, sh production sharing, but again, from my perspective, the devil's in the details. How does this thing work? <coughs> now, in order, in order to discuss the various elements of, of the fiscal regime, uh, I need to give you my bias. Uh, and here's my bias. I'm an economist, and so because I'm an economist, relative prices matter. Uh, that, the, that the fiscal regime is going, to set, is going to determine a set of, perhaps a set of relative prices that the investor is going to respond to, okay? And the government need, is going to be is going to be providing those price signals, perhaps via a negotiation. Uh, the government's going to may be a competitor in the international markets, and we'll come back to that in in, in a minute. Uh, uh, and the government, the, both the government and the investor, has got to re, have got to be able to respond to the, those price signals in international markets. So. The implication is, is that the type of payment, there may be a relationship between the form and the function of the payments. That it is simply not a question of rent. That there can be opportunity cost. There can be real cost in an economy for, if, given the way that the country 
chooses to design its fiscal regime. <coughs> now, this framework then looks at the separation of ownership between factors of production. What the government owns is a factor of production. It owns the reserves in the ground. So, so part of the perspective that, I'm, that I want us to consider is that, that payment for the ownership right and what that payment, what that, what that payment means. <coughs> uh, and that the operator, the mining company, doesn't own the reserves in the ground. The mining company owns machinery and equipment, contracts with labor that it uses in combination with the reserves in the ground to produce some marketable output. So, so at the first blush, I'm going to treat this process as any other industrial process. Use inputs to produce outputs. <coughs> But governments do more than just become resource owners, okay? Governments may wear up to four different hats. Uh, the first, of course, is being a resource owner. Zambia has a clear statement that the reserves, that the natural resources in the ground are held by the state. So the first thing that, that being a resource owner you have to be concerned about is the management of that asset. But that's not all that the government needs to do. The second aspect of uh, uh, thing that the government may have to do is that they may have to be a tax collector. And it's going to impose a generally applicable tax system, corporate profits tax, personal income tax, value added tax, excise taxes, tariffs, whatever they may be. And it's going to impose that generally applicable tax not only on the mining sector, but on all the sectors of the economy. But the, the, the government's going to have that job even if the government doesn't own the reserves. So you may want to use a different set of economic criteria in evaluating how the tax system works relative to the payment for the, for the resource owner. The third thing the government may be is it may be an investor. It may choose to take an equity position in mining companies, in power companies, uh, and Zambia has chosen under the current regime to take, a, take an equity interest via ZCCM in, in the mining companies. So being an investor is going to trigger a different set of expectations and, and a different payment structure that may, in fact, um, have an effect on the overall cash flow to the government as well as the overall risk borne by the government. And then finally, the government may, in fact, choose to be an operator. Uh, and that's different from being a passive investor. I can buy, any of us can buy shares of, of a mining company on the international stock exchanges and be a, and be a passive investor and participate in, in, uh, in the returns to the mining industry. But it's a different thing to be actually become an operator, uh, to make the decisions about how much to invest, when to invest, uh, how to extract, the, all the management that goes, goes along with that. So given these four potential hats, there are both gains and losses. Like in everything in economics, there are benefits and there are costs. Um, and the gains from ownership, the way these payments are structured, you may, the government may get bonuses, may get auction bids, royalties, including variable royalties, or it may, in fact, choose to use some type of excess profit scheme. <clears throat> some of the potential costs are you extract this stuff, it's gone forever. You've permanently reduced the wealth of the country. 
And so when you, when you deplete the stock, you've got to worry about whether or not the flow of income that you're getting is going to be sufficient to recover for the, for the reduction in the value of the stock. <clears throat> With respect to the general tax function, benefits are clear. You get revenue, okay? You get revenue. But the way the government chooses to tax creates distortions. Uh, and these distortions are going to affect private sector decision making. Uh, and in addition, there's going to be additional administrative cost and compliance. If the government chooses to be a passive investor, then it may get dividends and capital gains from, from, from its investment in, in the mining operations. Um, and it may get interest if it, if it puts forth shareholder loans to the, to the investor. Uh, and there may be price participation agreements. Uh, and we'll come back to, to a discuss, discussion of that later on. But there's no free lunch here either. If the government makes a investment in equity participation in the mine, one thing is, is that it may make the, the economy less diversified. Uh, by, make, by taking a long position in mining, both by owning the reserves and by taking an equity participation in the capital stock, it, there, there are resources there that may not be available for other uses in the economy uh, to invest in agriculture or to do things that, that would help diversify the economy. So, so the country may in fact be more exposed to international market risk than it would be if it, had, if, if it had chosen to make investments in other sectors as opposed to mining. And then if it chooses to be an operating company, the gains, profits from the operating company, returns to management, all the things that, that you get from being, having returns to management. But the costs there are, again, loss of diversification, uh, loss of diversification, and there could be efficiency cost depending on whether or not the state enterprise is reasonably efficient at making an operation. <coughs> so the implications of this four hat approach are that um, prices become important signals uh, in, this, in this type of, of environment. Um, and that the structure of contracts and the deal that the government wants will depend on a number of things. I'm sure you have all heard the phrase international best practice. From my perspective, there's no such thing as international best practice. The, the structure of any deal for any country is going to depend on the level of income in the country, the degree of diversification of the economy, the ability of the economy to absorb risk uh, and to be able to be diversified, uh, as well as the type of mineral and the geological structure of the specific access in mining. So, Four different hats, four different ways about thinking about things, but application is idios should be idiosyncratic to the specific situation of the country. <coughs> now, my general conclusion in, in looking at this and looking at the, the, the situation uh, as, as I found it uh, in, in my discussions in Zambia, is that the, the regime tax royalty system, a fairly robust system, it seems to me. Um, uh, and so the question is, is not to change the system as much as how the system works. <clears throat> and as I say for the rest of my remarks, the devil is really going to be in the details. Let's skip, let's skip that. So, well, let me, let, me, let me just make one comment before, 
I with respect to my criteria for looking at doing an evaluation, one thing that I think is important for all of us is the need to be transparent. Uh, some understanding of how how these contracts work, how the tax system works, uh, an open dialogue like this one, um, uh, data uh, on mining operations, uh, data on equity participation, all that type of thing uh, is really important, I think, in terms of developing the, uh, a reasonable regime for Zambia. Okay. Now, with respect to the things I'd like for you to consider, I need to tell you my bias, and you need to be aware of three things. Uh, first of all, I'm an American, if you didn't already know. <laughs> Secondly, I'm an economist, you know that. Uh, and if you can tell from my accent, I'm from the South. Those three things are gonna have an impact on how I think you may want to consider changes in your regime. The first has to do with me being an American. In the United States, if I find petroleum in my backyard, it's mine. It's not the government's. It's mine. Exxon does not come to the U.S. government and make a contract to, to mine, to pump oil out of my backyard. They make a deal with me. I own the reserves. And so if you're the government of Zambia, the, your first interest is, it's mine. It's mine. The second thing is, is I'm an economist, and so my natural reaction is, what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Company comes to me and says, we've got $10 billion, you've got $10 billion of reserves in the ground. And I said, and my reaction is, you prepared to write a check? <laughs> no, 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 oh, that, that's, that's revenue. Well, what part of the 10, 10 billion is mine? I own the reserves. I own the reserves. Don't, let's not talk about Let's not talk about gasoline prices. Let's talk about what's in it for me. Uh, and being an economist, I know, here's what I know. I know I am not a geologist, and I am not a, a mineral accountant, and all that stuff is way above my head. Uh, and so, when, when, they, when the company says, well, let's do a deal, I'm going to take a deep breath. And I'm going to spend at least a little time looking around to see if there are other sectors of the economy where I can learn about how I might structure my deal. And that's part three of being a Southerner. It's almost springtime in the South. And in the South, we have a big tradition where the farmers, where the farmers grow strawberries. And you go out in the country in the springtime uh, on a beautiful Saturday afternoon, and you can go into the, into the fields of the farmer, farmer's field, and you can pick strawberries in the farmer's field, and you can pick as many strawberries as you want. But there are two things that are important. The first one is everybody knows the price. Everybody knows the price. The farmer knows the price. All the consumers in the neighborhood knows the know the price. The farmers know the price that's being charged by the farm down the road. So everybody knows the price. And the second thing is, is the scales belong to the farmer. The farmer is the one counting the quantity. <clears throat> and so my reaction as the resource owner of looking at, at, a, at a resource contract is to concentrate on price and quantity. That if I don't concentrate on price and quantity, 
I've lost the war before I've even started. Mining is not strawberry picking. Big upfront investments, capital investments, lots of risk capital, all that type of thing. But if I don't control, if I don't have a mutual agreement with price and quantity, about price and quantity, then, then I know that it's not just a matter of getting a bad or a good deal. I will never know whether I had a good, bad or good deal to begin with. And so I know that I, I'm not an expert in this stuff. And so when I negotiate a deal with a company, I will say, here is my accountant. Here is my geologist. I'm a good enough economist to know that anything that's taken out of the ground, we measure the quality, is going to be measured with error. But my guy's here. And so the probability of an underestimate of output is going to be reduced. Uh, and the other thing I know is, <coughs> skip that. Um, the other thing I know is that being the resource owner, I own the reserves. I own the reserves. And the way Zambia imposes the royalty these days is that it may impose the royalty on concentrate, it may impose the royalty on mill output, <coughs> or it may impose uh, the royalty on smelter output. If you look at Bob's perspective, I own the reserves. I own the reserves. And so what my job is to stand on my property and count the stuff that's going out the door from my property and that means measuring the quality adjusted ore because that's what I'm selling. Um, that's what I'm selling and the other thing I know is that once it gets outside of my property and gets further downstream, it's going to get mixed with your stuff and your stuff and it becomes this big blob of a thing called copper. And I can't identify my copper, my ore anymore. So, so what I think you may want to, the, the bottom line for me is for you to consider whether or not to treat mining like a bonded warehouse for, um, for excise pr tax purposes. If you, if, for those of you know, who know anything about tax administration, uh, you produce booze and, that gets, and, and the booze gets produced and the excise becomes payable when it comes out of the bonded warehouse. And so, so treat, treating the mine like a bonded warehouse, concentrating on price and quantity, it seems to me is a way of getting at least that first round payment for the reserves. The second thing about price and quantity that's important is one of the things you'll see in the paper is that based on just a rough computation of statutory rates uh, before the rates were changed in this, in this budget, for every, for every P and Q, Zambia could be getting uh, at least 46 cents on a dollar. When you go through and you compute, compute the um, uh, profits tax, the withholding taxes, and the dividends payable to ZCCM based on, on all those netbacks uh, and, and the payments through, throughout the tax structure. We, we've gone through that one. Okay. Now, the profits tax, just briefly, I want to touch on two other things and then, and then I'll, we'll, we'll open it for discussion. The profits tax is a tax on the return to equity capital. Economic, economically speaking, that's the purpose of the profits tax. The profits tax is not a tax on mining. Profits tax is a tax on the, on the return to equity capital. Okay. 
Uh, and as such, I would argue that the, that the tax on the return to equity capital in mining should be the same as the tax on the return to equity capital in textiles or agriculture or any other, um, any other type of economic activity. And the idea is to ensure what's called intersectoral neutrality that you don't want the tax system, at least as the first, unless you're consciously doing it, you don't want the tax system to bias in favor or against one activity relative to another. Uh, and as I said, in the United States, mining, even though the federal government doesn't own the petroleum in my backyard, the marginal effective tax rates in the United States on, on, on natural resources are the lowest of all the industries. Um, and there are reasons for that that have to do with expensing, how depreciation, how, how depreciation is computed, how the treatment of amortization of exploration and development expenses, um, issues of thin capitalization, uh, allocation of risk, both internal and external. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons for, the, for that rate to be as low as it is. Uh, and, but those are issues that are not just, and let me emphasize, are not just issues in the mining industry. They're issues that are generally applicable to all the sectors in the Zambian economy. And so when you develop a policy, say, for hedging, or a, a policy for thin capitalization, you should be thinking not just mining thin capitalization. I would encourage you to think about what it means to, for, the, for, for the thin capitalization rule across all the sectors of the economy. <coughs> now, a couple of com two more two more comments, and 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 I'll stop. The first has to do with your measure of a. Um, uh, this, this variable rate pr profits tax uh, that, has, that was enacted in 2008. Um, these schemes tend to be common throughout the world. This, your variable rate scheme is, is modeled a bit on the one in South Africa. Uh, <coughs> not, not, the, not quite the same, but, but modeled on the one in South Africa. Um, and I will tell you my bias. My bias is, is that that variable rate is based on a ratio, and it's based on an average. And if you, if for the for the economists in the audience, you know that economists don't compute averages. What matters is the margin and the total. Uh, and so it's the relationship between the margin and the total and the average that's important. And so using some measure of the average return is not really an indicator of profitability. As a matter of fact, this variable rate royalty scheme, this variable rate profit scheme, could actually turn, be effective, paying an official 15% when profitability is negative. Um, and so the, so the question is, is whether or not there are alternatives if you, want, if you think that, that the government should participate or gain with increased profitability, whether or not there are, there are schemes that may be a bit more efficient. And there, there are some out there. One, one that I like, that the industry appears to like, are price participation agreements. Uh, my uh, concentrator makes a deal with the smelter to smelt output under a long-term contract. LME price goes up above some base level. Level smelter gets a cut, but it gets a cut not on the total, but just on the increment. Um, and so there are options to this. Um, uh, to this variable royalty scheme, variable profit scheme that you may want to consider. And then finally, <coughs> let me skip that. 
finally, with respect to equity participation, if you're going to be an equity participant, you've got to be an active equity participant. Uh, you have a minority shareholder interest, but you've got minority rights. Uh, you've got minority rights, and you ought to exercise those rights, and you should be asking ZCCM, where's the money? Where's the dividends? Uh, ZCCM should be asking the companies that has interest, where's the money? Where's the accounting? And I will close by saying there will be no better way of learning about any of this than to publish everything. There should be a list publicly available of all the holdings that ZCCM has, it's the details of its equity participation, and the, the flows of the payments. In addition, I would argue, as, 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 we, as we've seen in some other countries, that every day in the newspaper, there is published in the newspaper the price and the revenues that accrue to the government uh, based, on, based on the royalties. There's no way to, in, to get public participation and to get some understanding un, better than to have active participation and active information. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop and let the commenters speak and then hopefully we can open it for discussion. Thank you very much. Um. The background to the mining in Zambia and mining taxation, I want to look at the, the very, very brief, I'm not going to bore you with a long talking, uh, brief background, the life cycle, then taxation, comments, and just one line on the conclusion. Uh, mining is long term. Uh, it's not an area where you invest and expect to, to get very quick returns. It's long term. It's capital intensive. It's also a risky business. Uh, that probably explains why there is very low level of Zambian participation in the, in the mining. Because there is no law that prevents Zambians from getting into mining. But you find that uh, even those that have the resources, there are other areas, like the economists have said, where they can get a better return like property and other areas like that. <coughs> in, in Zambia, we've gone through three phases. We had private ownership of the mining, then we nationalized, then we are in private ownership again. Uh, during the period of uh, private ownership, uh, a lot of the infrastructure were developed during that period, including towns. During the period of uh, nationalized mining industry, for 30 years, from 1972 to, to 2000, it's almost 30 years. Um, production finally went down to a very low level, that in 2000, it had dropped to 257, from a high level of 750,000 tons. Um, there were a lot of reasons, but one reason is that the share order the owner in this part, in this case, the state, did not have, did not make provision for investing. And, and we know why. There are competing uh, requirements. Do you reinvest in mining or do you build a hospital? But the bottom line is that the infrastructure dilapidated to the point where the productive capacity of that infrastructure had dropped to a very low level. After privatization, uh, there have been investments, inflow of funds into the, into the sector, and production has gone up again. Uh, from the 250,000 in 2000 to 720 in 2010, we expect to reach 750 in 2011. This has happened because of the massive investment that has gone into, into, the, into the mining sector. 
when we come to the issue of uh, taxation, the mining industry is not treated differently from the other sectors. What may be different is probably the, the figures. Today, company tax is 30% as opposed to 35 in manufacturing and 15% in agriculture. But the rules regarding who is tax liable are the same. Like any business project, mining has a life cycle. You, you start from the geologists, you have to look for the, for, the, for, the, for the mineral in the ground. Even after that has been identified, you have to ascertain the size of the whole body, what is the size of the reserves, what meteorological processes you are going to, to, to use, before finally producing a bankable document. <coughs> then you look for the money and you start your designing, procurement. It could, takes, it could take you a number of years before you produce the first uh, kilogram of the metal. And during this period, the company has been spending money. They have been paying the wages, they have been paying for the equipment, they have been paying for the supply. So when the production starts, it's, it's, uh, the, the laws, the taxation law, the income tax law, is clear. Uh, if you had spent eight years constructing to before becoming, starting the production, you are not expected to start paying income tax in the, in the ninth year if you spent eight years constructing. You have um, carryover losses. Sometimes those carryover losses are brought about by the the poor by the low uh, metal prices. Sometimes it's also because you are not producing. So you, your costs were, were, were losses. So it takes a bit of time from the time you start producing to the when you become tax liable and start paying the, the income tax. I, I am saying this because uh, I sometimes feel mining is assessed on a, stamp, on a snapshot, uh, the people, they look at, for example, the year 2008 and say, oh, taxation or contribution from mining was very low. Therefore, as a nation, we are not getting a fair, a fair share of our resources. Yes, the taxation is low for a number of reasons. With the nationalization, and the subsequent privatization, it means that the mining industry, which had collapsed, went through a rebirth. Now, all of people here who are parents, you know what it is if the eight children you have were all born in, on the same day. You see, we, we are lucky because they are spaced over a number of years. But with the, the privatization of the mining industry, it's like the whole industry now, we are now again born on the same day. So there is the reinvestment, and because of that, there is a time lag before the companies become tax liable. When the metal price increase, it shortens that, that period of waiting before a company becomes tax liable. Uh, Professor uh, Bob has made a statement and said, with the increase, in the metal prices, there has not been a corresponding increase in the revenues flowing into the government. He is correct, but it's because some of those companies are not tax liable yet, and in fact, he, he went up to 2008. The situation after 2008 has changed. The, 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 there is more and more revenue flowing into the government coffers, into the, into the government treasury. And when those projects mature, there will be a fairly steep rise into the, the collections getting into the, the government. But the projects must mature. If, if you started, if you spent eight years constructing, you cannot be expected to start paying tax in the 10th year. There is also another factor which sometimes is not fully appreciated, is that after the completion of the privatization process in 2000, in 2000, the price of the metal went down from over 
80 cents per pound to 61 cents per pound. The, the owners didn't go back to government and start to say, let's negotiate. They bore the burden of that loss. They went to the shareholders for additional funding. So when the price of the metal started rising in 2003, they had carryover tax losses coming from there. So the combination of the carryover tax losses and the capital allowances has meant that some companies are not paying the company tax. There are, of course, other taxes which they are paying and forming another contribution, which, again, Professor Bob has very quite rightly observed it, that even though, in terms of GDP, the contribution from mining is on about 9%, but in terms of the money that goes into the government coffers, the mining industry, what comes from the mining industry, in terms of pay, in terms of export levies and other things like that, the, the, the persuasion is very different. It's the biggest contributor. For example, when you look at personal tax, I know the argument is that that's money that's coming from the employees. But that employee would not pay that tax if he wasn't employed. For every 100 million kwacha that the Ministry of Finance, or ZRIA, collects as personal tax from mining employees, the next sector is about 20 million. So, yes, the, the personal tax is coming from the, the employee salaries, but without the mining, that would not have been collected. So the same goes for other areas, and that accounts why, even though the GDP is low, in terms of what gets into the government treasury, the mining what comes from the mining through the various taxes is high. So, what am I saying? I am saying, if you look at mining as a business project, as a business venture, for that business to be sustainable, to continue, there must be sufficient funds for them to continue investing. What would constitute a fair taxation system? A fair taxation system is, is a win-win situation where the government gets the revenues and the mine owner also gets revenues to continue operating. Because otherwise, if you have one cow, you milk it dry and it dies, then everybody has lost. The owner of the cow has lost and the government has lost. And it has happened. In the case of Zambia, that has happened. From 750,000 tons to 257,000 tons, we reached a point where the system was not even paying any royalties at all because it, they had no capacity to pay royalties, apart from not paying company tax and so on. In fact, it went further than that. We reached a point where government was subsidizing the system because there was no investment. So with the private ownership, at least the thing that happened is that on signing the sale agreement, that subsidy went. And now we are in a situation where mining companies are also contributing company tax. The only thing is that not every company is tax liable yet. I thank you. The lack of consensus in this country and the lack of government regulators and civil servants and all of us who are today advising government is the lack of change in how we tax and administer taxation in the country. I want to put it across to you that what I see is, from my friend's perspective, definitely there has been privatization. Definitely there have been investment. But the way taxation has been practiced has not changed the way it was being undertaken when the industry was an extension of government. As a chief government mining engineer, I was doing the work of supervising the mining, mining, mining industry on behalf of the Ministry of Mines, on behalf of the Ministry of Finance. And we were working closely together with him as a worker then with, Z, with ZCCM as a company. So the rules have changed. We have to realize that when you create a change in policy and privatize, the state has contradictory objectives from the objectives of a profit-motivated, foreign-dominated, and foreign investment company. And if you don't change your rules, then there will be problems, and the rules have not changed. 
I'm very grateful, and I sincerely agree with Professor Conrad, that the responsibility of a owner of a resource is to know what he is selling and the price that he's getting. And this is where, as a government and as a state, we have failed. Because when it was ZCCM, we are one and the same. We are speaking the same language. But he has clearly pointed out that there is no information on the side of the state. The investor, as an participant and investor, has a whole information on that, both quantity and price, which government hasn't. Zedare hasn't. Minister of Finance hasn't. Minister of Mines hasn't. So they are all in the dark. And all these problems about integrated companies, third parties, are real in the mining industry. And we have to take corrective actions. And in the discussions and reports of Professor Conrad, he has offered possibly some of the best solutions. I want to share with you what I think are key issues in the corrective actions that we have to impose. Given the capacity and the lack of information on the side of government, it is not possible and it's not right to use some of the tax systems that are currently used. He has correctly pointed out that, for example, this variable profit tax system has no economic rationale. And if it has no economic rationale, it also hasn't got logic because you cannot agree on what is profitable between a government and an investor. You just can't agree. So you have to use simple and administratively clear taxation systems. And there is no clearer and easier taxation system as, as than that imposed on you as an owner, and therefore, as Professor Conrad has said, you are selling the reserves. If you are selling the reserves, you have to know and measure and quantify those reserves. And base your net take on the reserves and the quality of the reserves. So in economics and in mining economics, every mine is different, and therefore every mine should be ring-faced and treated separately and taxed separately. If you don't do that, you are not going to take, get a fair taxation system. So first and foremost, there is no better proposal other than using a royalty-based system as a method of taxation. These complicated formulas of variable profit or even profit participation are not easy to administer. The rate of royalty, we have to image with a consensus. A classmate of mine is now the minister of mines in Quebec, where I did my master's and trained and I was working there. The rate of mineral royalty in Quebec today I spoke to him on phone, is 16%. 16% in Quebec. Now, my friend, representing reasonably well, good investors, says 6% royalty is very high. Is it high compared to 16%? When you don't have sufficient information the investor has, you have to tax appropriately. And I think the mining industry, from the basis of royalty collection, about 20, 30 years ago, Professor Conrad, what was the mineral royalty rate in America? It was a, as high as 18% in the American government. Royalty, and they were using royalty and bidding. So we have to create a consensus. The problem here is uh, different from what may obtain in America, from what may obtain in Canada, and what may obtain in Sweden. The difference between a country, and the Professor Conrad was very clear and correct, 
that taxation should be seen on a country basis. If you are involved in mining, and for me, from an engineering point of view, only mining and agriculture create wealth. See the amount of wealth that Sweden and Norway have created for mining. But they have created that wealth because almost everything they produce in Sweden, which is predominantly steel, is manufactured and used in Sweden. And now Sweden is the, one of the most industrialized countries and uses all its steel. And some of the special steels that Sweden produces cannot be produced anywhere in the world. So it has integrated its mining industry in the economy. That's where we should be going. But for now, we have to create and make sufficient revenue for our minerals to improve what economists call determinants of economic growth. If you see where government should spend its taxes, it should be spending its taxes on improving determinants of economic development. Where are we going to get the money to implement and establish a good educational system so that our children and grandchildren are as qualified and as educated as the Japanese, as the Finnish, who are now the most educated people in the world because they have the best education system, the Finnish. Two, we have to create enough capital which we can invest in public utilities and services. We have to create sufficient capital to invest in research and development so that we can become participants in the globalized village which the world is. It is a problem, but I want to present to you that I have talked to all mining owners, investors, Chinese, Indians, Americans, Australians, they all agree they have to have a responsibility to pay taxes. If they don't pay taxes here, they will go and pay where they take their profits. The world is globalized. You should pay as much as you can pay where you produce. I have a few observations to make. I think the conclusions and debate from economics lawyers is that from a mining perspective now and from a development angle, mining is just as good as any investment, manufacturing, or making beer. So there should not be any reason so much to treat mining as a special sector. Because research and development, which some companies are making, for example, in the telecommunication industry, is just as good as the exploration in mining. It is true that it, research everywhere else takes time. See some of the people who are doing research on vaccines for AIDS. When are they, when are they going to realize their money? It's research and possibly of longer term and longer period than research and exploration in Lumwana, where Lumwana deposit was known in 1943. It's not, it was not, it, was, it is known. Almost everything else that is being mined in Zambia was known by 1943. So there is no invention. And minerals are not being invented. They are there already. You can even scan from remote sensing. But definitely, the issues on long-term investment and the recovering the costs born through development and exploration have to be taken into consideration when you are taxing. But mining should not be treated separately and differently from any other sector. And what is most important, and I want to advise those that are advising government and taxpayers, you cannot negotiate taxation. You just can't negotiate. Nobody wants 
to pay tax. So you cannot negotiate. It's like negotiating with a prisoner. You can't negotiate with a prisoner. He would like to be free. And therefore, if you go on negotiating with a new Canadian investor, with a new Australian investor, with a new Indian investor, with a new Chinese investor, you have individualized agreements and our individualized mining agreements purely create corruption and purely lower the social and political factors which are so essential for good governance and possibly the most important determinant of economic development. It's not the resources that we have. Most countries have resources. Those are passive. It's the social and political factors that are in the country that determine the rate of development of countries. I think I would like to end my submission. Then we can discuss. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to, to express my concern to the first uh, discussant. Um, but I'm happy and consoled by the good presentation discussion by Professor Mpande. I think we need to be patriotic. The truth of the matter is that uh, we are being ripped off as a country. And this is the second presentation we are having in three months, which is trying to highlight the same facts. Having said that, I'd like to mention that uh, look at the example you gave on uh, America. What is in your backyard is yours. Go to Sorwezi, those who have never been there. So Lwezi is where we're having so much billions of dollars being made by some companies. But they don't even have two roads. They have one road. Look at that. The infrastructure is being wasted, but even the little money which is given to government cannot even help government to do a good road in their area. So if you see that, then you know. If you are thinking, you should know there's something wrong in the system. So that thing needs to be reversed. And I think, uh, Professor Pande, you shouldn't waste time. You need to engage with your colleagues, our new government. Start talking to them. This is very, very important. But also very, very important is that uh, when you look at uh, learning, you don't even need to go to Canada. Let's go to Botswana. Why is Botswana rich? It's that, first of all, they have a system where they regulate and they capture all the production done on a daily basis. So nobody steals anything from them. But also, what they did, they were reinvesting. They were, you know, they had share holding of about 50%. But now they've, like, taken over. And all the mineral which is being done is managed by the government. So I think very, very important, again, is that uh, corruption in this country is created by what Professor Mpande has talked about, these issues of negotiation. And that's why you can see now, if you read in the media, we have people who are talking, when government says this, they're trying to defend the decisions they took, the negotiations, because now those people go back to say, you we negotiated, and I gave you this much. So these issues, so I think we need to be patriotic. So I hope my colleagues who are coming from government take note of these points which are being raised. Professor Pande, this is very important, and I think we need Zambian thinking like that. And one of them won't say, we get concerned. But I would like to mention that by then you are one of the managers. You are part of those bad managers who mismanage the mines. So those are issues, but now we need to think and see how we can take Zambia forward. Thank you. In this country, we talk about copper mining. And the only product we uh, charge or, 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 or concentrate on is copper. But I know from my association with other people, the geologists, that our ore actually contain much more than copper. So, uh, in certain ores you find cobalt, in certain ores you find all other these things of um, diamonds, and I know there are deposits here, I'm told whether that is speculation or not, uh, we have diamonds in northwestern province. But the licenses are on copper. I would want to hear from our discussions, as well as from government officials. What happens to the byproducts 
which in certain instances actually are more worthy than the pauper. Do we charge for that? It goes back to the information uh, Professor Conrad brought about. We know about these things, but why don't we charge for that? I would like us to get the value for our products which are in our backyard. Not only copper, which in fact when we put a price on cobalt, copper becomes literally a byproduct, value-wise. Thank you very much. Um, exploration could easily be done, yes, by separate companies. Uh, but you have to note that not every exploration project uh, ends up a viable mining project. On, on average, you are talking about one in ten, because in, in the, the economics or the price, whatever, may not be ripe at that particular time. And Dr. Mpande here talked about Lumana. Yes, Equinox did not discover the old border to Lumana. The, the, the exploration was done much earlier in 1962. But the economics were not ripe for someone to take up that project. So investors came and walked away until finally Equinox Copper Venture came in, did the exploration. They had to do additional exploration to determine the, the ore body, to determine the metrological processes, to even determine the trace elements my other colleagues have talked about. That's now why you have mining. So, if a company that has been involved in exploration decides to sell the mining right because they have produced the bankable documents, it's, it's like a coin concern. They have bought the mining right, they will get the mining license from the government, and, and it continues. From the country point of view, the country is not losing anything because we have a new owner. In the case where a company has been mining, like in the case of Romana is a good example, Barrick Gold now has bought the company. It's a going concern. Uh, that's the point where I think it's Professor um, Conrad talked about it. You get the benefit of the appreciation of your investment. ZCCM IH had invested $30 million into, into Rumwana. Barrick Gold decided to buy them at a much higher price. That's, that's again of the shareholder. So yes, when you sell your mining right, you are not, the country is not losing anything. The, you, 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 the, the, the initial one may have reasons why they don't want to proceed and, uh, and, 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 and get into, into mining. And also, there are, uh, particularly the, 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 the medium exploration companies, they may be specifically in mining to discover all for other people to take over later on. The larger mining companies tend to do their own exploration, the Anglo-American, Barrigold, BHB, Billiton, and those, and, and those smart mining companies. They don't raise money on the, on the international money market. They use their own resources and do exploration. And they write it off because, uh, like I say, it's, on an average, it's one project in 10 which ends up being uh, viable and proceeding to, to mining. Uh, what happened when Vendata bought KCM? That's, that's where you, you, you may be, that's the point you're talking about. You see, Case, Anglo American had a development agreement with government. When they walked away, the new owners negotiated a new development agreement with government. That, that's, the case, that's the only case that's applicable. But when Barrick Gold buys Rumana, they are buying it as a buying concern. When uh, the new company bought uh, Abidon in Mazabuka, they bought it as a going concern. There was no question of new agreement getting in. There was no new agreement. There is negotiations right now for an, another Chinese company to buy Chiburuma mines. There is no question of a new development, an agreement. Because in fact, there is no agreement at all. So the existence of copper, cobalt, gold was known in Rumana in 1943. 
Minde got small mines with the Geological Survey of China. Canada did some more work in 1962, as he says. Eh? And later on, Phelps Dodge, who are the shareholders of Zamefa, and the, the largest American copper mining company, got a, a license to try to mine Rumwana in my office in 1991, when I was minister in charge of mining. And they went on to do a feasibility study and do almost everything. Okay? <coughs> but they got more interested in what they thought was more profitable in the Congo, which has not yet even been realized. They ran away. Okay? They sold for a song, the Lumwana project, eh, to Equinox. And Equinox never raised any money. They went and borrowed $1 billion. Borrowed $1 billion because everything was good. Okay? And they started mining with borrowed money and therefore paying no tax. Eh? And the interest costs were being recapitalized and being borne by the treasurer, which was not getting any tax. They started mining and producing in 2005. Eh? Okay? Last year, they sold where they didn't invest. Eh? I said they borrowed. Eh? And they sold the mine for $7.2 billion. In developed countries, Canada included, Australia included, America included, they would have been taxed on $7.2 billion. Eh? Okay? As capital gain tax. Eh? Okay? And GRZ was going to get about 40% of $7.2 billion. Who is the representative of government if government has got 40% eh, of 7.2? GRZ hasn't got 7.2 or 40% of that. And mining companies have that habit. It has not happened just here in Rumwana. I've just told you the story where from borrowed money, three years down the road, you sell and you get 7.2 billion. And government doesn't get anything. Not even ZCCM investment has got 40% of that eh, from their shareholding. That's the tragedy. Okay? Can you just can you just they have the same twenty years tax exemption holidays. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> because <laughs> tax exemption. There are tax holidays in this country, isn't it? And carryover of so called losses eh, for ten years. Eh? So some of the investment costs that were being born are going to be carried over as expenses. So you have to be very clear on how you use the tax regulations. And Professor Conrad has possibly presented the best paper. He says, and correctly, he says the ambiguity in the rules and the regulations than the legal framework makes a honest taxpayer likely not to pay tax. And a dishonest taxpayer and a tax evader by administrative arrangements. That's what he has said. And correctly so from my mineral economics assessment. Okay? Honest taxpayers who, who pay no tax, eh? dishonest ones who evade tax because of rules and regulations you have put here. Okay? And sincerely, if you see, and increasingly saw the problem which is now going to face our government and our people, is definitely the economists say this is the 10th growing economy. But this is the poorest country after Niger. Niger, no, no, Niger in West Africa, one of the poorest countries. <laughs> the social indicators in Zambia are very poor, close to Niger, but it's the fastest growing economy. Because the so-called production, which is yours, eh, you haven't valued it, and it is going en masse, eh, and is not retained in the economy. That is not sustainable <coughs> development. 
And all of you tax advisors, policy advisors, me, I'm a teacher, and I've gone into teaching more and more. You know what I'm saying? What I'm doing here is advocacy, <laughs> which is teaching. Professor Conrad, we share the same thing. And he was very sincere. Just measure your price and quantity. Thank you. The ownership is in, 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 in diamonds, not, not in metal, no, not in base metal, because of, obviously, I think, because of the risks involved in base metal mining. The, the royalty in Botswana, in, the, in, the, in what I presented there, there is a, cha a table there showing the royalty rate in different, different, some of the different countries. The royalty rate in Botswana is 3% of value, it's three percent of value. Uh, Dr. Mpande talked about Canada. Canada is also listed there. It's between ten and eighteen percent, but it's not on revenue. It's, it's ten to eighteen percent of profit. The the correction that uh, you need to make on Zambia is not three percent, but six percent of export value. The other point was on uh, doc, Mr. Mdenda or Dr. Mdenda, I'm not sure. Um, he says uh, the anodes, 95% copper, and uh, what is the 5%? Um, first of all, when you look at the Zambian production, it's not every copper produced which is exported as an anode. The, the bulk of the Zambian production goes out as electrolytic copper, 99.9% copper. So there are no other trace elements. The mines that have economic value of trace elements, they declare them, they don't hide them. Kansanshi, they export a tank out slurry, and they produce gold, reasonable, and they pay tax on that gold and that sort of thing. The uranium, which is at Lumana, they are not producing it yet. They are stockpiling any ore where it says uranium contained into it. They have regulatory issues to sort out before they can construct a plant to process, to process uranium. If every copper ore contained gold to the level Mr. Mdenda is talking about. Indeed, the copper would be a byproduct. Who would, who would throw it away? And the government would know it, because the government has all got the geologists and the, and the, and the assays are declared publicly. They, they are declared on what, what is exported. Um, Dr. Mdenda, the, the other concern he has is about the concentrates. Again, it's very little concentrate that is exported. The back of the concentrates are treated here in Zambia and either end up through the Chambishi smelter or Chambishi copper smelter who export the, the anodes. The other people, the copper end up as refined copper, 99% copper, and therefore there is no question of uh, the trace elements coming in, into, into, the, into the picture. Uh, but all I would say that uh, if uh, the trace elements were asked uh, Mr. Mdenda's table, indeed, even the owners of the mine would be very rich because uh, the, 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 the copper would be byproduct. And uh, if that was the case, uh, projects like Rumana would not have stayed on the shelf since 1962. Investors would have really uh, climbed over each other to go and develop the, the, those, those resources. Uh, is the value of information. Um, it would be nice to see in the newspaper once a week uh, the quantity of ore extracted uh, by mine uh, and assays of the, the metallic content of each shipment. Um, uh, just information. Just information. Um, and then uh, having that understanding uh, as, as opposed to just finding it out here uh, on a regular basis where the citizens and the government and the companies have every expectation 
uh, of, of publishing that type of information. Uh, and then you, you can look at the tax revenue or the royalty revenue and say, too high, too low. You, can, you have a basis then of, of making an informed judgment. Uh, so I think the issue of quality is very important, but it comes back to this issue of just pure information, uh, public information uh, about, about the nature of the operations. The second question, the, the second point I want to make is about transfer pricing. Um, transfer pricing is an arcane, uh, tough area uh, uh, dominated by uh, specialists uh, who devote their whole lives to trying to figure out these alternative methods uh, of doing something that in my view uh, on interrelated party transactions ultimately comes out to be um, not arbitrary but a variable exercise. Uh, and so the important thing for a country like Zambia, as a matter of fact, I would say an important thing for a country like the United States is to have clear and perhaps clearly arbitrary rules to say, this is the way we're going to value things. Uh, you have head office charges, we're going to limit head office charges to X thousand dollars. Uh, you import this stuff, we're going to deem a price, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have a deemed price. And what we're going to do is that we're going to get the system started. We can make adjustments through time as we get experience, but we're going to get this system started. Um, uh, instead of applying, uh, instead of going to things like, as, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, the OECD transfer pricing rules, the, the, those types of things, are appeals to methodology. Um, and, there are, and, and so when someone says OECD transfer pricing rules, which one? When? So I think that that, that is important to be very transparent here uh, and say transfer pricing will never going to get the right answer. The company will never get the right answer. The government will never get the right answer. We, we are using some estimate, some estimated methodology. And let's admit that at the beginning and say, let's get the system started. Uh, and let's, let's have some clear, arbitrary, reasonable, reasonable rules, but let's let everybody know what they are. Uh, and to get the disputes down to a minimum so we can get the system started. The final issue has to do with this trade and title. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that this issue of, of capital gains in mining licenses has become a, a both an emotional uh, as well as a policy topic with respect to countries that that uh, where the where the licenses may be may be traded. Uh, let's be clear: the issue is going to depend on what's being sold. Uh, if it is just the license that's being sold, then your country should create ad adequate protection so that you define any trade and license as domestic source uh, and subject to the generally applicable income tax in the country. So if what you're selling is a license or trading in a license, you need to have you need to have those protections. The other thing you need to do with respect to those protections is that sometimes companies will trade the license and take or, and retain an interest in the property, and they will they will get what's called an overriding royalty, like the government gets a royalty, 
the company, the, the company that had the original interest may get an overriding royalty. That needs to be defined to be domestic source. There should be withholding taxes, regardless of whether or not that, the, the recipient is, is, a, is domestic or foreign. Uh, and your country should not, should be careful about negotiating treaties, tax treaties, with capital exporting countries that say, we want you to get those withholding tax rates low, uh, down to zero, because, if you, because you have to be careful in order to protect your own self-interest with respect to making sure that you have those, those protections. That said, the question then becomes, what happens when an, a company buys the company? Not the license, but the company. Uh, and is that company traded on an international market? Uh, where there, there have been examples in other countries where, where um, uh, uh, a, a particular company will negotiate a mining contract, the stock price goes up, say on the Canadian exchange or the New York exchange, the London exchange, and another company comes in and buys that company. Uh, you're going to have a tough time trying to capture that. The only way you're ever going to get that is to take an equity position in the international company, not the local one. Um, uh, but the idea is, 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 to always rem is that you need to remember what's happening with respect to those trades. Those trades are being taken with respect to the deal that's negotiated with the government for the mining, for the rights, and for, for the present value of that mine. And so the company that buys the existing company thinks that through time it's going to be able to recover that premium. And if you have a reasonable fiscal regime in your country, that's robust to profitability over time, then you should expect when that company pays that premium that through time you should expect increased returns from, from your contract. And so the questions may not come down to just taxing the gains or whether or not you can even tax the gains. This, that's a serious, uh, serious question. But it goes back to informed self-interest about how you design the fiscal regime in the first instance. So to make sure that you have adequate protection and the right to expect a reasonable return. And if you do those two things, then you will go a long way to resolving this issue about these, these trades and, the, and, and these capital gains and losses. Thank you. For instance, in one of your slides, you are saying that there was no dividends in remitted to government by ZCCL. Maybe I need further clarification on, on that. Then the other one is, in terms of the multiple participatory approach that government can, can take, which is the mining, the mining, being the mining operator or tax collector or being the resource owner. And, uh, the other. But my recommendation, I, I think, from listening to your issues that you have raised, I think the aspect Zambia can take the, early, the, the route of being the mining operator and also the resource owner, if you are to get around all this, this problem. If we can't, then probably we can also introduce a commission of inquiry in the mining sector to find out certain issues of this. And also, I just want to hear ex your experience if, if within the mining sector. In this country, there has been a lot of heated debates when an issue to do with the windfall taxes arises. So I want to hear from you, from your own experience, assuming Zambia was to introduce the windfall taxes, will the investors shy away overnight? Advocacy, Transparency International, Mining Consultant, and all that. 
is the structure of government and the way we manage our affairs. You know, two years ago, I did an indicative study on how to resolve some of these crises with a supposed be reformed mining tax unit in ZRA. And the, this issue, what Professor Conrad raised about price monitoring and production, from a mining engineering perspective, from a metallurgist perspective, from the time when you license a deposit, eh, the feasibility study has been done, metallurgical tests have been done. You can more or less anticipate the rate of extraction and recovery. And when I was chief government mine engineer, my colleague who was executive assistant to the chief chairman and chief executive, we used by every year get a return on the recovery rates for each one of their mines and the percentage of production from each one of their mines. And if there was a variance, they have to explain why. This is necessary. Information is necessary. But now, that is not available. And then somebody says there are now no rules like that. It's a pity. And that's why I'm saying the taxation arrangement and production and price monitoring have to be codified and regulated and monitored. The best instrument proposed is a price and production monitoring unit in the ministry of mines. And science and information is now available. You can put in a computer, in a concentrator, which at the end of the shift will transmit the percentages recovered eh, and percentages of what went in there. And can go straight on computer to Ministry of Mines, to ZRA, to Bank of Zambia. So that if there is any variation, you can ask as people are exporting. This is what you are supposed to export. I want to urge those that are now civil servants and politicians to really, and my elder brother who is now chairman of ZCCM Investment, to invest in this information. It's necessary. We had weekly, monthly meetings, annual meetings with ZCCM officials because I was on the side of government. But we are, and I was asking key questions. This is necessary, but it's no longer happening. So I urge you who are passionate like me to passionately follow up people in government and say, what are we supposed to be doing? Can we do it, please? Thank you. If they are producing concentrates, they declare how many tons of concentrates. They declare the, 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 the percentage of, of the mineral in there and what is called the metal contained in those concentrates. In this particular case, they're talking about copper contained in there. These returns are made both to the Ministry of Mines through the Mine Safety Department and to the Bank of Zambia. And when the time comes to export the, the mineral, they get an export license, which they, is given by the Ministry of, of Mines. Um, of course, not all producers export. Some of them, they sell locally. For example, those that are producing concentrates, but have no smelters of their own. They have no metallurgical, no other metallurgical process of their own. They sell their concentrates to the smelter. So their accounting is in Kwacha. And if those concentrates have trace elements, those trace elements will be for the, for the smelter, not for the, for the mine producer. But of course, if they knew that there was this uh, uh, amount of gold, they would have taken an interest in it. The fact that they haven't taken interest in it, it means the gold may be there, but not, not viable to, to recover when it goes to the, to, to the smelter. So the returns are done. The question maybe is what happens to those returns at the Mine Safety Department, what happens to those returns at the Bank of Zambia? The other question, I think, was for Professor regarding the, the, the multiple hats. And the, there was one question, one, one, one question talking about that maybe what we need here is the owner and the, and, and the operator. 
Um, I won't say much about it except to say that, uh, like Professor had already told us, every action you take has got its own risks. It has got advantages, it has got disadvantages. The biggest problem when the government owns and operates is that uh, the revenue they get from there, they have got competing requirements, like what happened in the past. Do you build a hospital or do you go and invest in, in, in a concentrator? And if they are not balancing, you end up um, losing the assets that, 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 that you, may, you may have had. You, you, you see, in coincidentally, at the beginning, in 1973, when we had 750,000, uh, Chile was producing 1 million tons of copper. Today, Chile produces 5 million tons of copper. We hear so much about Codeco, but what people don't maybe fully appreciate that, yes, Codeco is there, but the private companies are also operating in Chile. And in fact, most of the investment had come from the private investment. That's why they have moved from 1 million tons to 5 million tons of, of copper. The question of uh, gold going out not being declared, that, that I don't know. Because uh, if you get the trouble of seeing the returns that go to the mine safety department and the returns that go to Bank of Zambia, the companies that have gold are declaring them and paying tax on it. So I don't know who else is exporting gold without declaring. Maybe the very small, the very small, small, small operators. But like uh, Dr. Mpande talked about, it starts with your mining license. You are applying and saying that I've got this oil reserve and this is the grade. When that grade, that oil gets into the concentrator, it's monitored, sampled at every situation. So it's very easy to, to, to say the concentrator, the what's going into the concentrator, what is the grade? What is coming out of the concentrator to go to the tailings dams as a disposal material? What's the grade in it? Are we wasting material by throwing it into the dump? Or is it recoverable and that sort of thing? That information is there. It's a question of do we want it? Can we use it? And that sort of thing. The modern technology, what Dr. Mpande has talked about, yes, if there is an investment, then you, you can have data collection done automatically on, on behalf. When it, it, because even for the operation purposes, you, you get uh, overflows from the, from the concentrators. They are interested in what is going down the drain. Are we wasting material in the drain? What are we capturing? What is our recovery uh, percentages and that sort of thing? That information should be there and should be available because it's, 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 it's there. They need it for their own operation to control the efficiencies of, of, of the plant. So the question of uh, exporting gold without being declared, that I don't know. Because the ones I know that have gold and you can check the returns to MSD and the returns to the Bank of Zambia, the gold is there. Thank you. Uh, is a question about the structure uh, of ZCCM, the uh, prior liabilities that uh, when, the, when the company was restructured uh, years ago, uh, the, uh, on the environmental liabilities, uh, the pension liabilities and the other liabilities that, that were assumed by ZCCM at that time. Um, and at this point, uh, my understanding is is that th those things are still unresolved, and some and some audits and transparency would be helpful in understanding the relationship between these liabilities and the general government accounts. Um, uh, and ultimately, a state enterprise is part of the part of the government. Uh, but what you don't want it to become is an off-budget operation. Um, and so it's, it's, going to, it's important that the financial flows to and from the state enterprise be clear uh, and, that there be, and that there be adequate audits. Um, the, se the second question just briefly has to do with an excess, excess profits tax. Uh, I think 
Um, everybody, everybody has their view about what excess profits is. Um, uh, I mean, it, it, it's like economic rent. Everybody knows what economic rent is, but when you actually go to tax it, it ain't there. Um, uh, I, you have to be careful about two things. One, one is, is, that you, is that you can't take too many bites out of the apple. Uh, you have to worry about the overall effective tax rate or the, the rate of return on invested capital. But that's not nearly the, the, the concern that I have. My concern is, is that until you have the basic structure down and it's functionally reasonably well, putting another complicated instrument on top of it takes resources away from the administration and, and monitoring of the basic functions. Um, and so at this point, my idea would be, looking at it again from, from, from Bob's perspective, is to say before I get involved in equity participation, excess profits, taxes, all that sort of stuff, I want to make sure I'm getting an adequate return on my, re on my investment for having the, owning the reserves in the ground. Um, and so you have to be a bit careful. I'm not saying you shouldn't have an excess profits tax. It's part of a policy mix that may or may not make sense depending on, on the give and take. But it's not a free lunch. Um, it's not a free lunch in the sense that if you impose an excess profits tax, the risk structure, that the, the revenue structure to the government is going to change. And you have to be very aware of how, that, of how the revenue changes um, through time um, when you impose this additional instrument. The final question has to do with publication. Government, I, I come, of course, I come from a, from a democratic government um, uh, where, where there are always claims of transparency and there's public documentation and all this sort of stuff. Um, and it's true that, that countries have these, these rules and should have these rules, but that's not enough. The fact that information is public doesn't mean it's free. Um, Governments publish stuff. The reports go to the Ministry of Mines. They go to the they go to the central bank, uh, and and I can get in the United States. I can go to the Federal Reserve and ask for the information, and they'll say, "Oh, okay, uh, we'll get back to you. It's public information." Uh, and so, what's necessary is is a routine is a set of expectations, a set of publications where the information, it comes out on a regular basis. And so it's not just a matter of, of the legislation, which is a, an important first step about transparency. It's making sure that the government follows through and supplies the information in a cost-effective way. And, and you can begin to do that. There's no reason why the Ministry of Mines can't post on its website the, the production statistics every month and make them downloadable on a PC. Uh, that would go, that, those types of things will go a long way toward getting out the information that's necessary in order for the, the population to make informed judgments. Uh, and so, so again, is, the question is, is, is never, should you have the information? The answer is yes, but how the, the means with which you should be able to get it in a reasonably cost-effective manner. Thank you. This is a very important and interesting subject in Zambia. We could have gone on perhaps up to 21 hours. Well, it's getting there already. I told Bob Libethor, the country director of IGC, that I wouldn't make a summary of our discussions this evening because this is the first time we are discussing this. We must come back to it. And I'm, I have begged him that in a couple of weeks, in a couple of months, we should come back to this subject. A lot of people have got great interest they want to know more and more 
about the mining sector in this country. Mining is important for Zambia. Mining has been here for almost a hundred years. People still keep asking questions. When shall we ever get the right price for our reserves? This question is going to continue and it makes it necessary, therefore, for most organizations like ICG, EAZ, to continue organizing meetings like this one, informing each other about what is important for our country. And mining is one of those very important, not just emotional issues, but very important subject for citizens to understand just what it is when we talk about mining. I am compelled to thank the International Growth Center for coming up with this subject for this evening's discussion. I want to thank the Economic Association of Zambia for being instrumental in all this and in bringing together your, your members. I hope that next time we meet, it's not just your members, but please make known that there is such an important subject being discussed by yourselves as professionals, and the public should come and, uh, and listen to, to them. Professor Conrad, you have seen the reaction from the from the public. I want to thank you on their behalf for the information that you have left with us, for the presentation that you, you, have, you have made. It has been profound. It has touched on various issues, many areas that are of concern to those who are concerned with, the, with mining. I want to thank you and to hope that at some point when you come back again, we could invite you, if not as a presenter, but as a participant in our discussions on the mining industry in, in, in Zambia. I want to thank Mr. Frederick Bantubonse from the Chamber of Mines of Zambia for, for his views on the uh, on the subject that we, we have discussed, he has given us probably an insider's information, the kind of information to which a lot of us find it difficult to be privy, or the kind of information we find it difficult to, uh, to obtain. So we, we hope that with this kind of revelation, and when you go back to your, your, your chamber, uh, of minds, you will tell them that there are people out there who are discussing about mining, taxation and things without having adequate information or proper information. And so it falls upon your chamber of minds to help the population as to what the mines are doing. And if you feel that uh, the things they are doing are fair things, let them come out, and people will appreciate um, their existence here in Zambia. Dr. Mpande, I thank you also for your insights in, in, in this subject and in many areas of, um, of the mining industry. Your experience as a civil servant, as a minister, as a teacher, has been quite obvious to us this evening, and we have benefited a great deal from those experiences from which you, you have come. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to thank you all also for taking your time, finding time to come and join the uh, IGC and the Economic Association of Zambia for this evening's meeting. Please, this concludes the meeting. We will tell you when we can meet again. Good night, everybody.